Hello and welcome back to the Clean Sailors podcast, all about sea, marine, sailing and keeping it clean. I'm your host, Holly, founder of Clean Sailors and a sailor myself with a passion for the health of our mighty oceans. In our podcast, we explore some of the ways in which sailing and our wider marine industry can become that bit cleaner through conversations with experts, innovators, scientists and activists, all working towards the health of our seas. We showcase the people and projects changing the way things are done. For thousands of years, we humans have been building boats. We began and indeed continued for centuries with wood. Whilst beautiful, buoyant and full of soul, wooden boats are heavy, high maintenance and utilise a now incredibly, increasingly precious natural resource. The birth and mass commercialisation of plastics changed the game in boat building. And since the late 1940s, we've been making boats from glass or fibre reinforced plastic. It's light, durable, highly malleable, strong and very low maintenance in comparison to wood. Building new boats, however, has been a pretty carbon intensive process and continues to have an impact on our natural environment, even if unintended. In this episode, we speak with two experts, Friedrich Dreimann and Jan Paul Schremer of Green Boats, a small German-based team with big ambitions for building boats in a cleaner and more efficient way. Friedrich, firstly, thank you so, so much for joining me on this conversation. You're welcome. It's great to hear, obviously, to find a company such as yourself and a and a person or brain such as your own who is thinking very differently around the future of boat building, right? And I think firstly, for a bit of background, we know that there's a massive issue with end-of-life boats, right? GRP and FRP, so glass and fibre reinforced plastics. What is it about Green Boat that is looking at boat building a little bit differently? Exactly. We actually, yeah, thought about how you can like bring down the footprint of a boat. And exactly, you you were talking about the issues about the recycling of the glass fiber reinforced composite because right now there are no ways to really recycle glass fiber composites. So you can just like, I don't know, use them like shred it down with a, a lot of energy consumption and then mix it up in concrete or in outer barn, barn or <laughs> whatever, but it's pretty much just, just landfill. So it's a big problem about that. And we are actually searching for alternative solutions. So we are looking into natural fibers that we can use instead of the glass fiber. Because one thing is they don't need that much energy in times of production. Um, So they are pretty much CO2 neutral because they just grow on an acre. And we are able to recycle some. And what is it about natural fibers, right? Because I appreciate, obviously, for centuries and centuries before plastic, if not thousands of years, human beings have been, we've all been getting by really well with natural fibers, whether it's for clothing or buildings. So what are the natural fibers you're using and why, maybe even towards end of life, could that make a difference in the sort of circularity of boat building? So we are actually uh, working a lot with linen fiber, we call them flax fibers as well, because we have like comparable strengths as a glass fiber composite. And the big, like the positive points about these materials is that, yeah, you need five times less energy for the production compared to a glass fiber. And yeah, it, takes CO2 from the atmosphere by growing on the acre. So when you are like, actually, you could just burn them because they burn like totally. And yeah, if you compare that to the glass fiber, you can't burn the glass fiber. And the other thing is when, when you burn it, it's yeah CO2 neutral because the CO2 gets in the atmosphere by burning, taken before by during the growth of the plant Mm. so yeah and what do you so if you're saying 
presumably you're mixing natural fibers with other materials, right, to make a composite strong enough, A to be, I guess, molded into the shape of a sailing vessel. And it's got to be strong enough. It's got to be watertight, waterproof. What else is going in there? And, and I appreciate you're saying that if you're, you know, it's carbon neutral, if you kind of burn it, but what else is then part of that process? And is there a, another way to like recycle it? So there are actually different ways. So we have one way is we can use thermo, thermoplastic resin systems where you can really get or reshape the material after the life cycle. You just like heat the material up, and bring it in a new shape. But that is as, as well like not an, yeah, an endless solution because after, I don't know, two times or something like that, if the fiber don't have and the thermoplastic resin doesn't have the, the strength anymore. So that is just like one solution. And the other thing we use is like epoxy resin systems. This epoxy resin systems, they are based on plant oil too. So we have actually, we have a, yeah, a lot of different solutions and you really need to choose, choose which solution is the right for your product. Because the first thing, like, or the first point in terms of sustainability should be yeah, a long-lasting product. Like if you're not doing some packaging or stuff like that. So you should really focus on, okay, I want to build a boat. First thing, you want to, to build a boat that lasts really for a long time and that can be used like for, I don't know, at least 40 years or something. So, and so composite itself, like as well, like just the glass fiber composite from the environmental perspective is actually quite good because it's, it's a long-lasting product but there are just no ways to recycle. So it's not in total a good solution. So how did Green Boat come about? Like, what was your inspiration for it exactly? I'm a boat builder in profession. And I actually, I learned how to build wooden boats, a childhood dream. So I actually, I, I started sailing when I was 10 years old. And I actually, I always wanted to become a craftsman. So actually, I wanted to become a carpenter. And after I started to sail, I was really like impressed of boats because you couldn't really, and like a hull, how can they build like a three dimension? And I was so impressed about that so that I just decided I want to become a boat builder from profession. And I actually, I, I, I yeah, did the refit project when I was like 13 or, or 14 years old of yes, a small wooden boat. And I continued that. And, and when I was 17, I built it like a wooden canoe. And yeah, then I really know when I'm finished school, I'm, I'm going to be a boat builder. So that was pretty much my way. And I just continued on it. So yeah. And it was like my first contact with building materials for boats and was just like a beautiful natural material. And you could say, okay, hey, why are we doing this? Or why green composites or whatever? You can just build a boat from wood and then it's all fine. <laughs> but it's just like a lot more work to build a wooden boat. It's the most cases a wooden boat is a lot heavier. It's a lot yeah, easier to bring a composite into like a three-dimensional shape than wood. And it takes a lot of maintenance to keep it like nice and that it's not starting to rot during the lifetime. And so after my apprentice, I actually, or I recognized very fast that wooden boat building is not the common way to build boats. So after my apprentice, I worked in a, in a company where they were building GPR tender boats and special components from glass, carbon fiber, and all this toxic, toxic stuff. And actually, I was impressed about the possibilities you have with composites because you're totally free in shape easy to 
Yeah, to build in serious production, really lightweight, really strong, durable. So great, great, actually great material. But I just didn't like to work with that materials. So it, it was, yeah, really interesting to build them or to process them like on a high level, like really high-end composites, like in vacuum infusion or with pre or, or stuff like that. So that's really interesting and the possibilities are really great. But I thought, okay, from the builder perspective, when I build a wooden boat, I just put some nice clear coat on top and it's like a really like emotional product and it just looks great. And when I do that with a glass fiber hull or something like that, it's just something ugly. And <laughs> you start grinding these materials and the smell of the resins is just disgusting. And as well, once I've like finished the painting job, it looks somehow like a nice white shiny or whatever but i know exactly what's behind and that is actually just disgusting so i started to think about solutions so that you can use the technique of yeah high-tech composite but using different input materials so using flex fiber instead of glass fiber, using resin systems that are not based on raw oil. So using some, they are based on plant oil. And yeah, try to exchange like all the materials, like as well as the core materials, you have different options for that. Normally it's just like a synthetic foam and we are actually using um, one option is like the recycled plastic bottles or cork or other wood or stuff like that. So, or paper, paper honeycomb. And so I just started to do a lot of research and tried a lot of different materials with the thought in my head that you need to find something that is like as well available on the market. And it actually needs to work. So I can't just do something that is like, I don't know, dissolving itself during the life cycle. So, yeah, so that's where, yeah, where we are like coming from. And with this building technique, we can save like 80% CO2. So when you have a look on the footprint of the product, we perform LC. LCA analytics for each product and yeah so <laughs> that's huge I mean 82% CO2 saving in comparison to traditional boat building is colossal right I mean that's yeah and, that's significant and it's still it's still growing because like right now we still have in the epoxy resin systems there are still like petrochemical parts to get it like real durable but this is as well like changing a lot. So we have we have one really good working system. system there we have like sixty percent bio base, and the rest is uh, petrochemical. But right now we are doing testings with most uh, epoxy resin systems. They are up to ninety percent bio based. So it it's really a lot of yeah things happening in this market. Mm, and, a lot of improvements. It sounds like yeah, a lot of yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think what's most interesting is listening to you say how you've obviously experienced sort of wooden boat building and you appreciated that there's a craft to it, right? There's there's something very beautiful and there's something very personal about it. You're using a tree which is in itself spent decades growing and all individual and every piece of wood is significantly different to another, right? But actually appreciating too that it's incredibly impractical these days. That it slows your boat down. They're beautiful, but they're very heavy. And we're also running out of wood, you know, appreciating that there are, you know, the best sort of, whether it's oak or teak or whatever else that, you know, boats have been traditionally made of well, are in becoming more and more scarce. Teak in particular is, as you know, there's a big global issue with teak, it being available, I think only really in Myanmar at the moment. So, but listening to the, to you talk about Greenboat and actually how you've married that feeling of craftsmanship into it, right? I mean, these are moulded hulls so there is an element of manufacturing them but 
you know, you're talking about the way that it, it smells and the fibres that are in it. And I mean, they look beautiful, to be fair. They look, green boats look made, not manufactured and appreciating that they are moulded in much similar process as a manufactured boat would be. But you do certainly, the aesthetic does show that consideration that's gone into them for sure. And Friedrich, really your founder of Green Boats and the sort of flax based composite and Paul as joint managing director. What did the journey look like for you specifically in the beginning? I joined in 2017. So the company was started in 2013. Friedrich already had four years of experience. He already built the Green Benter in 2016. And the Green Benter, in essence, was a serial product, a Benter 24, but built out of 80% natural resources. However, at the same weight and same sailing properties. So that was a big sensation. And Friedrich also won the Biocomposite Award and other environmental prizes. So it's important to emphasize that Friedrich really did this more or less on his own as a boat builder, as a one-man show, together with an apprentice at the time, Theo, and a second apprentice who joined towards the completion of the boat, Luca. So that was all Friedrich, 100%. I didn't contribute anything to that. (laughs) But what was fascinating to me when I met Friedrich was there was a person that was so 100% immersed in his craft, into what he's doing, and he was not running around trying to impress anybody. He was just really focused on his work. Can you apply it to, to other lightweight applications, other industries? And what happened was at the time that Friedrich got more and more inquiries because he got some nice press coverage from the Green Venture Project. And he literally said to me, <laughs> Paul, I don't answer emails because whenever I answer an email, there's another one coming back. <laughs> and then I don't have time to work in the workshop. So I realized maybe there's some symbiotic potential between the two of us. And so at the beginning, I just advised him on a couple of projects and helped him to prepare a couple of offers. And then one project got quite serious. It was like a small scale production of, I think at the time, 20 units, not a boat, not a boat, but like a glamping, camping application. And Friedrich said to me, Paul, you know, you can come over (laughs) as much as you like, but if I make that deal, you you know, we might as well do it together because I really want to focus on the product and, and I'm not so interested on the business side. So then we sat down, went to the notary and started the business together. Are you looking for Greenboat to become, you know, the new way as a technology, a new way of actually boat building across the world, for example? What's your vision? So actually right now we have different things we are doing or we have as well like a lot of different markets and we are definitely about to grow. So because we have so many as well like in the automotive industry, like if you can imagine like camper vans or stuff like that. So they are all like really interesting, interested in this materials. And we are actually doing as well, like a lot of panel materials as the sandwich materials that you can use in a lot of different industries. And we are actually really about like to do a, a big step because we did a lot of projects, like in the past, we did a lot of projects just to show what's possible and to, yeah, to show how nice these materials are. And now we are exactly in on this point where we need to scale up. So one thing is we want to, to scale up the production of the Flux 27, like just a small series production. We really want to scale up like panel production because we think it's a nice way to get the people in contact, like as well like the builders with the natural fiber reinforced composites because mm-hmm. it's just like a lot easier to process like the finished panels, a safe example for the interior of a boat or oh. like for, I don't know, barcades or something like that. When you are not needed to find out like everything about the materials just like yeah the strengths how you process them where you to buy them which resin system you should use and and other sort of stuff so yeah so that is where we are just like just working on and what about for you paul literally uh, horizon one is basically anything you can see now that's within sight and so that's what we're focusing on right now and that's especially the idea of closing the performance gap, showing that it's possible to achieve the same or better performance using sustainable materials, getting people excited about what it is we are doing. 
working together, for example, with professional sailing teams like Levitt Hour, we did some components for, and at the moment we work together with a Boris Herrmann, a German offshore sailor. And this is just providing an amazing platform, right? To show people their sport that they love and show that it's possible also beautiful looking. <laughs> That's also another of our traits. Beautiful looking, high performance products made of natural and recycled materials. So that's Rise of One, right? Create awareness, get people excited, show what's possible. And we are right now as a company actually yeah, moving into Horizon 2. And Horizon 2 basically means also closing the cost gap. So oh. another nice term for this is turning the green premium that you have to pay for a sustainable product into a green discount. And in Horizon 2, I would say we have to reach price parity or cost parity. So we have to create products that also are able to compete, not outperform, but compete in terms of price with other products in the market. And for this, the niche of our day sailors is really great. I mean, it's a really, really tiny market niche, high-end day sailors, but it is a market, let's say 100 boats of those are sold every year. And when you look at that high-end market of 27, whatever, just below 30-foot day sailors, what are the characteristics? Break it down into our three variables. So cost, performance in terms of weight, speed, and of course, sustainability. So when you look at that with the Flex 27, we have for the first time, to our knowledge, created a lateral fiber NFC product that is able to compete and also partially outperform on these three variables, right? So we have a product which is, from, in terms of price, depending on what equipment you choose, but around 100,000 to 150,000 euros are cheap, <laughs> but that's what people pay in this high-end detailer market. So we can compete on price. We can compete in terms of performance. I mean, our hull, our whole boat, thanks to more than 10 years of experience on Friedrich's side, and especially the last three years, we've invested a lot into really mastering uh, and coming up with a couple of tricks. We are managing to build 10, more than 10%. So the GRP weight that we calculated for the design was 1,350 kilogram for the whole boat, ready to sail. And we end up with our serial product at 1,200. So we save 150 kilo on yeah, 1,350 kilos. So that's more than 10%. And yeah, I think that's quite amazing. And that to us is really the definition of a Horizon 2 product, right? You have a product that has its own merit that can stand in the market and people don't have to assign like some kind of idealistic value to it. It's just really competing. And we're very proud of this and it took us a couple of years to get there, but yeah, that's Horizon 2. And let's move forward to Horizon 3. Horizon 3 is a point in time. We don't know when, but we are convinced at some point in time, all these externalities, pollution, emissions, are going to be perfectly priced into products. Meaning, maybe it is some kind of technology like, like blockchain or related. I mean, that's not really our area of expertise, but just to name drop some things. But the idea would be that you can measure and communicate the true sustainability of your product and very objectively, 100% accurately. And that is just reflected in the price of your product. So in such a world, and we firmly believe in that, in such a world, building more sustainable or the ability to build more sustainably everything else being the same is going to become one, probably even the most important driver of competitive advantage. So this is Horizon 3. We can also start the other way around when we talk about Horizons. Sure. And your Flex 27, just for our listeners, is your is your kind of day sailing boat, right? I mean, this is your, would you say it's like the first most, I say not important, but your most kind of huge milestone for you in, in terms of actually creating this day sailor boat, this 27, Flex 27. I mean, it's, as I mentioned, it's very, very good looking, but this is evidence that not only does this material do what it says, and be made of better, more natural materials, but it's it's seaworthy, right? I mean, these these boats are super seaworthy. <laughs> yeah, yes, as well. Like the design, or we saw a lot of of the design, and it's not like a really modern design. It's like modern modern underwater, but it's like a real timeless design, more like classic lines and clean. And we thought, okay, that is something as well. Maybe, maybe, yeah, a good, good point for sustainability because I think as well, like in 20 years, it will still 
look nice from the shape because they, I think there are some lines that will n never look ugly. So no one would tell about like, I don't know, a nice like wooden boat. I don't know, in 50 years, no one would tell, okay, no, that's not a nice design. It's like as well with old houses or something. Often things go out of date and you can see, you know, obviously different boats from different different decades all have quite a distinctive style and obviously different boat builders have distinctive styles. And I think you're right, there's something very classic about it at the same time being quite innovative looking. It's very sleek. It's got obviously sort of a centre cockpit, sits quite low in the water, but it is beautiful. And also to your point about panels, right, because these could be, you know, using this composite material for panels could be used in a whole variety of different industries. I'm thinking even from your, obviously from your super yacht interiors to your, almost like you mentioned, the camper vans and the, even almost like you think about kitchen, anything that's hard wearing and that needs needs some resilience, but also some, I think to your point, being more sustainability minded in production, trying to get ourselves away from the inherent reliance we have on sort of plastic and epoxy resins would be super right so it does feel like this is almost like just the beginning in some ways I appreciate you're not entirely new but it does feel like a very beginning of an exciting next stage of your journey hey exactly and why is it such a good time for green boats what about the context over the last few years has been so ripe a foundation for greener cleaner composites we did predict, of course, there's a combination of bottom-up pressure by consumers who are becoming more and more aware of the footprint and you know, the non-priced externalities of their products. And also we were hoping for some kind of government action, yeah, top-down pressure, creating incentives for companies to adopt more sustainable technologies. And yeah, we knew from our cooperation with the University of Bremen that just... Uh, for example, in the way we build the green bento, we are able to save or reduce the CO2 footprint to 60 to 80 percent, so quite significantly. We're not talking about like a margin of effect, but quite a significant effect. So we knew all of these factors and we expected, well, this is going to come to play at some point between the next five to 10 years. And then in reality, already in 2020, when the last big show before COVID hit, yeah, it really showed, you know, that people from within the industry were really interested in what we're doing. And yeah, we were getting just a different kind of feedback and also our inbox was growing and growing. And that's when we decided, hey, all good, but we have to go about this a bit more strategically and not just run after the orders, but what's our strategy in this? You know, how are we going to scale this? How are we going to have an impact with what we're doing? I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Clean Sailors podcast. All relevant links to the projects and people we talk to can be found with the podcast link. For all episodes or to get in touch, just visit cleansailors.com. We love to hear from you. We believe that great ideas should be shared, which is why our podcast is free to appear on. So if you've got a project, idea or topic you think we should be discussing, get in touch. In the meantime, thank you for listening and see you for the next episode. Bye.